Good morning. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are meeting this morning um, to do a little bit of work to help our friends down in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, they have a um, they have a, a bill H183, which is an act relating to sexual violence. The bill contemplates creating um, a, a task force or a council of uh, of higher education um, representatives to do some work on um, collaborating on best practices to reduce sexual violence on campuses in Vermont. And so the Judiciary Committee is dealing with uh, with um, all of the other sections of the bill, um, but but they've asked us to help uh, in terms of giving some input into the creation yeah. of this council. And so we want to hear from some of the folks who uh, who may be members of the council um, and uh, and hear their thoughts on uh, on whether the makeup of the of this new council is uh, appropriate if they have recommendations um, and we will share those recommendations with the Judiciary Committee. So what I would like to do first is invite uh, Michelle Childs to, to give us just sort of a, an overview of the, the bill in general, just, you know, very, just help us orient us since we're not immersed um, as a GovOps committee in, uh, in what the bill is. And then if you could uh, help us look in particular at the section of the bill as introduced uh, that creates this council. And then we can hear from some of the folks who are here to testify about this council. So thanks. Welcome, Michelle. Nice to see you Thank again. Thank you. Good morning. Nice to see everybody. So um, I was just planning on going over that one section, but did, did, does it sound like you wanted to hear about the whole bill? I think it would be helpful to just have, you know, three to five minutes on, you know, what, what does the rest of the bill do? Just, just so that this committee who may not have um, been as aware of this bill um, has an opportunity to understand how the council fits in. Sure. Is it okay if I can pull up the current um, House Judiciary Strike All? Is that yeah. Yeah. okay if I do that? Yeah, let's make um, you a uh, co-host and you can do that. Sure. The, well, sorry, that I picked up a different, uh, I thought I was just going to go over the one. So let me, um, let me get a hold of that. We'll call it a brisk jog through the bill. How's okay, that? <laughs> sure. Okay. Do you page one of five? Yes. Um, that's not the right one. Sorry. Apologies. Um, there's been a lot of these. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I can only imagine how many tabs our legislative council draft. Yeah, you're have. my fourth committee this morning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, oh, hold on a second. Sorry. There we go. Okay, can you see that version two? Yes. Okay, great. And I can um, I can send this to Andrea if you want me to. Um, it's not as you can see; it's still in draft form. They haven't voted it out yet, and it's got a lot of highlighting. Um, I, but let me know if you want me to send it because I had it is available on House Judiciary's website. Um, That's fine. Yeah. So there's a few different issues here. And first, we're going to start out with the criminal provisions that are contained in here. So these are making amendments to the sexual assault chapter in Title 13. So Title 13 being your criminal title, Chapter 72 being your title with regard to uh, sexual assault. And we're starting out with, um, with the definitions. And a lot of what um, the amendments to 
um, to the sexual assault statutes have to do with in this proposal are around the issue of consent and what does consent mean? Um, so you see, we do have an existing definition of consent in section one, in section 3251. And you'll see currently consent means words or actions by a person indicating a voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act. And um, this adds um, the, that it is a knowing or voluntary agreement. Um, there's also a new definition um, that comes from federal law. And a lot of the tweaks here are based on what is currently in the US code in Title 10 with regard to um, sexual assault uh, and in, in the military code. That was updated I believe in 2008 and 2015. Um, so they have, so they are the federal law that's most recently adopted. If you look at Title 18 in the federal code, that hasn't been amended since I believe the 80s, and so it's a little older. But this, uh, but this definition comes directly from federal law. So incapable of consenting means the person's incapable of appraising the nature of the conduct at issue or physically incapable of declining participation in or communicating an unwillingness to engage in a sexual act. There's definitions of developmental disability and psychiatric disability. That's not changing what's in the current law, but is uh, updating it with respectful language that we currently use in statute. Because as you know, oftentimes when we're going through and amending statutes, we'll come across terms that we no longer use and we try to update them where appropriate. So in section two, with regard to sexual assault, um, you'll see in subsection A, it um, states that no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person. And you'll see the first one is without the consent of the other person. And then you have other provisions in there around threats or placing the person in fear that they'll suffer imminent bodily injury. And you'll see the addition of the language on starting on line seven um, is that when the person knows or reasonably should know that the other person is asleep, unconscious, or otherwise unaware that the sexual act is occurring. So clarifying that when you have someone who is, um, uh, is asleep, unconscious, or, or otherwise unaware of the conduct, that that does not constitute consent. Subsection B, uh, the current law just focuses on the issue of if an actor uh, uh, gives another person drugs or alcohol without their knowledge or against their will and then proceeds to engage in a sexual act with them, it is a crime. And so sub subdivision B1 just rewords that a little bit and updates the language and has to do, and that so that still applies to when the actor administers an intoxicant to another person without their knowledge. But subdivision B2 is new language um, addressing the, the circumstance where, uh, where the actor isn't necessarily the person who, who uh, gives the, uh, the survivor a uh, alcohol or drugs, but, um, but however, they engage in a sexual act with a person who is incapable of consenting. And there's that term again uh, on line 18, where we just talked about it, that's in the definition section. So a person um, engages in a sexual act with a person who's incapable of consenting due to substantial impairment by alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants. And that condition is known or reasonably should be known by the person. So in subdivision one, you have a certain circumstance where there drugging a person without their knowledge and engaging in a sexual act with them. And subdivision two is they're engaging in a sexual act with them when they know or reasonably should know that that person cannot consent because they're substantially impaired by an intoxicant. And so I'm just, just to be trying to move through, I'm gonna skip over some stuff, but feel Folks can always email me and I'll circle back with y'all another time when you have more time. Um, so section three, uh, this is an existing law on trial procedure and consent. So there is language currently in statute that builds out in, in more detail about consent. Um, this just tries to clarify that. You'll see, you know, lack of uh, verbal or physical resistance doesn't con con constitute consent. Um, uh, neither does submission resulting from the use of force, uh, threat of force or placing another person in fear. 
Um, an expression of lack of consent through words or conduct means there is no consent. So that's essentially no means no. Um, subdivision four is a reference to our existing rape shield law that says that you cannot uh, take uh, into evidence and offer a trial of, of victims um, prior sexual history or the way they were dressed or things like that. Um, subdivision five, kind of obvious, a sleeping or unconscious person cannot consent. Subdivision six, uh, a person shall be deemed to have acted without the consent of the other person. And then it goes through and gives some, some uh, different circumstances. So the first one being that they knew or reasonably should have known that the person was mentally incapable of understanding the nature of the sexual act. Um, B, that they knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was not physically capable of resisting or declining consent. C is that they knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was unaware that the conduct was being committed. D is that the person knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was incapable of consenting to the sexual act uh, due to a psychiatric or developmental disability. And so again, this is in current law, we, we tweaked a little bit to have respectful language, but also I just wanna note here that this does not say that just because someone has a psychiatric or developmental disability that they are therefore incapable of consenting because certainly people are. This is saying that if because of the disability, the person is incapable of consenting. And then you go back up to the definition. So that disability makes them either unaware of the ability, unable to appraise the nature of the conduct or physically incapable of resisting the conduct, then, um, then that would not constitute consent. And then subdivision E is that the person knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was incapable of con consenting um, because the person was substantially impaired by alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants. I know that was super fast, but um, you get the gist, I think. Um, section four is on data collection. So this was um, requested by advocates who were saying, you know, there's, there's really not, there's not enough information to kind of track what's happening um, to reports of sexual violence throughout the system. What happens? We, we know that, um, uh, that these types of cases are, um, are very hard to bring. They're often just two people who are involved and, and no witnesses. And, um, and so there is a, you know, it tends to be a low reporting um, rate. And then, you know, I'm sure that the witnesses can talk about the, the statistics and numbers there, but the cases that actually then got, have charges brought, and then there's an actual disposition of those um, in a conviction are, are few. And so um, advocates have asked for um, some data on this. So on or before September 1st of 2024, and then biannually thereafter, DPS and DPS, I'm sure as you guys know, um, Vermont Crime Information Center is within DPS. They're the repository for all the criminal history records and they're to report to you um, based on data from the National Incident-Based Reporting System and the Vermont Judiciary on the following issues. Uh, the first being the number of sexual violence cases reported to law enforcement. Um, second one is the number of civil sexual assault or stalking orders granted. There is a provision in Title 12 under court procedure that allows for a victim to obtain a restraining order in cases of sexual assault or stalking. Um, subdivision C in line eight is the number of sexual violence cases that law enforcement then refers to uh, a prosecutor. So in the first one you have like how many reports are made and then you'll see in C how many reports then actually get referred for prosecution. Subdivision D is the number of sexual violence cases charged, the nature of the charge and the disposition of the charges. Subdivision two says that that data has gotta be aggregated by county. And then subsection B um, says that the Department of Public Safety has to make a reasonable effort to protect victim confidentiality when statistical information may be identifying. We live in a small state. Sometimes that's difficult when you're working with a, with a small community. And um, 
So that provision's in there. And then subsection C is that DPS is to post this data on their website in a, in a way that's clear and understandable so people can access it. So section five, <clears throat> excuse me, is the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council. And um, so uh, this creates the council. This is um, comes from a recommendation of a previous uh, committee and report that I think probably uh, Sarah will talk about, um, or maybe some of the other witnesses. And the council is created to coordinate a response to campus sexual harm, including across institutions of higher learning in Vermont. In subsection B, you have the members. Um, so this is, I know, what you're going to focus on. So currently, um, the members are the Title IX coordinator from each institution of higher learning in Vermont, a campus-based prevention education coordinator who is appointed by the Vermont State Colleges, a campus-based prevention education coordinator appointed by the University of Vermont, a campus-based prevention educa education coordinator appointed by the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges, two community-based sexual violence advocates appointed by the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, two law enforcement, um, I think that should say, or public safety representatives, um, with experience responding to and investigating campus sexual violence, um, and they would be appointed by the Commissioner of Public Safety. Two college students appointed by the Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, top of page seven, a person with expertise in sexual violence responses within the LGBTQ community appointed by the Center for Crime Victim Services. And then um, the, new, the, the new language that is being offered for consideration is on lines four through seven. So the first being a sexual assault nurse examiner appointed by the network. Sexual assault nurse examiners are uh, professionals who are trained to collect evidence um, after, uh, after a sexual assault. And so um, those uh, nurses are trained and available at hospitals. So when someone reports a sexual assault, uh, they can go to a hospital. Um, there will be a sane nurse who will meet them there and can conduct the, um, the examination. Um, there's a, a part later on that I'll show you that has an appropriation so that that program can be expanded to general practitioners and outside the hospital context, because as you can imagine, you know, there's only hospitals in certain parts of the state. And so if you are in an area where you've got a two hour drive to a hospital and you've just been sexually assaulted, um, that uh, compounds uh, things. So, uh, and then finally, 10 is a prosecutor from either the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs or the Office of the Attorney General. And I just put kind of appointed by because usually we'll say a state's attorney appointed by the executive director of the department, or we'll say somebody from the AG's office appointed by the AG. This is just a prosecutor. And then so you'll have to if you figure out who you want, if you want to keep that provision, uh, who you want the appointing authority to be. Subsection C goes through the duties. Um, Michelle, can I uh, interrupt you for a moment? Because Mark Higley sure. has his hand up. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michelle, before you go much further, can you tell sure. me what that number adds up to? And again, uh, I'm, I'm not knowing that because I don't know how many uh, institutions of higher learning there are in Vermont. So do you have a total number of that council makeup? Um, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. No, but so, but again, going, going back to uh, membership B1, so it's a, co a coordinator from each institution of higher learning in Vermont. Oh, oh, no, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's a good point. Okay, thank um, you. The, probably the witnesses can. Okay, thanks. Sure. I see in the chat that there are 12 um, entities. 12, okay. Thank you. 
Um, so there's the, the duties um, that you can take a look at. Uh, they're gonna be staffed by the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, they are due to um, provide a report on or before December, 2022. Um, and annually thereafter, the council shall submit a written report to General Assembly with a summary of activities and any recommendations for legislative action. Um, let's see. They select a chair from among the members at the first meeting. Majority of the membership constitutes a quorum. If they aren't being paid by, let's say, the organization that they work for, so let's say in the, in the cases of the students, or um, then uh, they would be entitled to per diem uh, and expenses. And there is appropriation here that we'll, I'll show you here. So you see in section six uh, for FY22, $13,000 is appropriated to the network for the purpose of staffing the council and also paying the per diems and expenses for those members who aren't otherwise uh, compensated. And then in subsection B, that's the money I talked about that would go towards expanding um, the forensic nursing program out to uh, primary care and reproductive health care settings, so beyond the hospital setting. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's go to some of the other folks who are with us and, and committee. I'm, um, hopefully that was a, a good uh, introduction to the, to the bill and what it does. Um, and it's our role here to just make recommendations on whether this is um, the right, uh, you know, the right makeup of this council and, um, and whether we, uh, whether we want to add other entities. And so I think what I'd like to do is go first to Sarah Robinson um, with the Network uh, Against uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence. Uh, this is the entity who would uh, is contemplated to, to be staffing the council. And if you could share with us uh, a little bit about the, the makeup of the this group and if there have been conversations that you've been aware of um, about either adding or changing membership um, to, to this council. So welcome. Sure. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Uh, and for those of you who may be less familiar with us, the Vermont Network serves as the statewide voice on issues related to domestic and sexual violence in Vermont. And we represent 15 independent nonprofit organizations who together provide direct services to victims of domestic and sexual violence across our state. And together, these organizations serve every square mile of Vermont. So thank you again for the invitation to provide testimony on H183, which is a bill that on whole seeks to address and improve Vermont's system of response to sexual violence. And I'll specifically speak to uh, section five that I know you all are contemplating today. And by way of a little bit of context, uh, in May of 2019, the legislature passed Act 77, which uh, was a miscellaneous judiciary bill. And it included language in section four, which created a time-limited task force on campus sexual harm. And that task force was charged to examine issues related to responses to sexual harm, dating and intimate partner violence and stalking on campuses. Uh, of post-secondary educational institutions in Vermont and to uh, report to the legislature on or before March 15th, 2020 with findings and any recommendations for legislative language. So that task force met over a period of nine months and held six formal in-person meetings. And the final report of that task force is posted to the committee's web webpage. And after that final report was submitted, that body sunsetted. And the, the establishment of an ongoing council on campus sexual violence was a key recommendation and discussion of this previous task force. Um, and will really serve to coordinate and innovate responses to sexual violence on co college campuses across Vermont. That is the intent. And by way of a, a little bit of context, I just wanted to share that one in five female students 
and over one in five transgender students are sexually assaulted on college campuses. And women ages 18 to 24 are four times more likely than women of other ages to experience sexual violence. And sexual violence within these institutions of higher learning is especially complex due to issues such as student privacy, Title IX proceedings, and variable law enforcement involvement in campus sexual assaults. So the, the council proposed in H-183 will insist in ensuring that both responses and prevention efforts on campuses across Vermont are coordinated and that resources and best practices are shared across both large and small private and public institutions. Um, and in terms of the composition, much of this came out of conversations that the previous task force had had and some of the members of that previous task force are included on this proposed council. There were also recommendations that were made by the attorney general's office to add uh, a prosecutor and a SANE nurse, and we were supportive of those recommendations. You'll see in the language that the administrative staffing and resources to support this council is dedicated to the network at the moment. And I'll just say that the previous uh, campus sexual harm task force indicated in their report that a, a permanent body such as this ought to have some staffing capacity and at least some minimal resources to carry out their work. Um, but they did not as an entity decide where those resources ought to be dedicated. And I will just say as the network, we have no attachment to staffing this committee, but we are more than willing to do so. And if there is a more appropriate staffing structure that others propose, we would be amenable to, to those suggestions. But the composition of the council is intended to really represent the various stakeholders that serve survivors of domestic and sex or of sexual violence on college campuses and bring together individuals who may have resources to share um, and knowledge bases to share, to have interdisciplinary and ongoing conversations about supporting uh, our institutions of higher learning and students and ensuring that they can access their education on campus. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that members of the committee might have. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Tanya Vihovsky has a question. Wonderful, thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Sarah, it's nice to see you. Um, so we know that um, those who generally can speak best to problems within a system are those who are most impacted by that system. And that said, I'm really grateful to see representation from the LGBTQIA plus community and college students. And I'm wondering if thought was given to the pros and cons of having a survivor um, or a space held for someone who has survived sexual violence on a college campus. And I don't, and I know some of these members could be that, but it's not explicitly named here. And I'm just curious if you can speak to that. It's an excellent question. Um, I can say that part of the intent of those two college students appointed by the Center for Crime Victim Services was to create the space for individuals who may identify as um, survivors of sexual assault to serve on the council. Um, the fact that the appointing agency is housed in the Center for Crime Victim Services kind of makes that attachment. But the reason that language was chosen was because people have various um, levels of comfort with being publicly identified as survivors of, of sexual violence. So the um, idea was to provide a more general language and um, with the expectation that there may be people who identify as survivors who might seek to fill those seats. Um, thank you. As as just, I'm just wondering if, as sort of a caveat to that, there might be language added with a to, to sort of put out that a priority is given to individuals who have had that experience. We would certainly be amenable to to language such as that. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, the run through of the clarification of consent. Uh, consent, Michelle. Um, I I uh, I. I I'm sympathetic to Tanya's worry, but it seems to me it's also highlighted by the fact that there are only, uh, out of 20 some odd members of the council, there are only two students. And so that the small number of young people uh, immediately raises the issue of whether they are identifiable as victims or not. And I, I'm just, I'm struck with that quite apart from Tanya's uh, point about making sure that the voices of people who have suffered 
uh, this grievous harm uh, are also heard from, but not necessarily uh, put uh, in an awkward position, I guess. But the fewness of numbers just uh, heightens that possibility, I think. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so um, back to Mark Higley's question before um, on how many uh, entities there were. I believe um, the tally that I have is 12 private entities in Vermont, four Vermont State College entities and the University of Vermont. And, uh, and so what I'd like to do now is go to, um, to some of the folks who are with us from our institutions of higher learning. And I think I'm gonna go first to Vermont State Colleges and I see Patricia Turley and Michelle Whitman are here from Vermont State Colleges. So I'm not sure if you already flipped a coin or if you both have thoughts that you'd like to share with us, but uh, please help us understand uh, how the Vermont State College system feels about the makeup of this council. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will go first and Michelle is available uh, primarily because she is a Title IX coordinator. And so she really, I believe she was also on the task force. So she has some firsthand experience here if that's valuable to you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this legislation. My name is Patty Turley. I am the general counsel for the Vermont State Colleges. Uh, as you just heard, we have four institutions. They are Northern Vermont University, Castleton University, Vermont Technical College, and Community College of Vermont. We support uh, the, you know, I'm here primarily about the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council. We support this effort. Uh, some of our employees have participated in the legislative task force and also in a separate intercollegiate sexual violence group. Uh, one of them is here today, Michelle Whitmore, who is a Title IX coordinator at Northern Vermont University, and she participated in the legislative task force, I believe. We're concerned about two areas, um, although we, we totally support this bill. We're, we're behind uh, the collaboration, the sharing of best practices. We think that that is, um, that that is a, a good target. Our first uh, concern would be that the legislation doesn't identify the um, what the how many meetings per year, what the what the time frame might be that is uh, considered here. So we we think that that would be um, helpful so that we can understand the undertaking better. Our second concern is that as written, we would contribute four Title IX coordinators because we have four institutions. Due to the size of our institutions, none of our Title IX coordinators are dedicated to that role exclusively. They all have other duties outside of Title IX, um, which are providing different types of services to students, depending on the, the campus that they're serving. If all of our Title IX coordinators are attending regular meetings, they are not able to provide the services that they do to students. And uh, although, a, um, that, that creates a gap that nobody else on their campus is really able to, to fill. We would request that the committee consider allowing the VSE to send one coordinator as opposed to one per institution. We, we understand that the different institutions all have different experiences with the Title IX uh, uh, and other um, sexual assault issues that they might experience. However, our coordinators communicate with each other. They uh, support and problem solve together um, in a regular, although usually informal fashion. Uh, and if we designated one individual to, to attend this council, uh, we believe that they, would, that they would be communicating with each other for that purpose because they share this goal as well. Uh, that is, that's primarily what I am here to, to describe. And I don't know if you have questions of me or of, in particular of Michelle. Michelle, is there anything in particular that you wanted to express before we move to questions? Thank you. Um, I just really wanted to echo uh, Patty's statement just about the, the commitment and the time dedicated as a Title IX coordinator on a Vermont uh, State College campus that already is very lean in staffing. And for myself in particular, as, as the Northern Vermont University Title IX coordinator, um, that is in addition to my role as the Associate Dean of Students and Senior Women Administrator, 
uh, in addition to uh, orientating first year experiences. So um, this work is incredibly important um, and in focusing in this work, you need to really be dedicated to do so. And, and we all as Title IX coordinators are very much dedicated to this work, but the time that is then decreased in, in focusing on the students on campus, the other day-to-day -day responsibilities that we have takes a seat back. And I just want that to be noted um, and certainly echo what Patty had shared about the importance of, of possibly having one Title IX coordinator for the Vermont State College system. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much to both of you. Um, I, I think what I'd like to do next is hear from uh, Susan Stitley, who's the uh, president of the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. So Susan, please share your thoughts on the council. Well, thank you for having me today. Uh, you know, of course, our, we have 12 private colleges in the state, uh, Bennington College, Champlain, Landmark, Goddard, Norwich University, Middlebury, SIT, Sterling College, St. Mike's, Vermont College of Fine Arts, Vermont Law School, and the Center for Cartoon Studies. So it's a wide range of group, uh, ranging group with uh, different levels of student populations. The Center for Cartoon Studies only has 40, approximately 40 stu students um, and up to you know 2,500 for the larger institutions. But everyone is very supportive uh, and uh, of the council. Um, it is a lot of members on the council. My count came up with 29. Uh, so each uh, the, with the 12 private colleges and then another appointee um, that specializes in education and the rest, it, it, I would be a little concerned that it's a little unwieldy with that many people on the council. Um, but you know that, that said, our Title IX coordinators are certainly uh, willing and happy to serve. Uh, and the other um, outstanding issue that we've discussed is the requirement of an annual climate survey. Um, there is a lot of hes some hesitancy around that. It's very time consuming to do a climate survey. Um, it takes a lot of implementation and administrative work and doing it on an annual basis. Um, people express concern that, you know, views don't change that much annually. So uh, having, and, and there's also student fatigue with surveys. So perhaps making that a biannual, um, biannual annual survey would be a better approach to that. And I, I don't believe that legislation addresses how many times the council is actually going to meet. Um, and then of course, there's a question of, is it in person or is it on Zoom? Or maybe it's gonna be a combination of both when uh, we are through this pandemic. Uh, but four to six times a year seems a reasonable amount uh, to most of the Title IX coordinators. And really that's um, all of our thinking on it. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much. Um, would you recommend um, that, that we uh, specify fewer uh, representatives of, of private institutions. I, I know you said the Center for Cartoon Studies has 40 students and that seems perhaps um, a, a very different animal than, you know, your Middlebury College or your St. Mike's. Yeah, I, the challenge with that is, you know, each each college is so different and so independent. And although the Title IX coordinators do get together and meet, it's not like the Vermont State College system where they're all part of one system. Um, so I, I think it probably is appropriate to have for the private colleges, one representative from each institution. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Wendy Koenig, thank you for being with us. Uh, Wendy is here representing the University of Vermont. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning for the record. I'm Wendy Koenig. I'm the director of federal and state relations for UVM. Um, I, I'm going to give some testimony that I consulted on with our general counsel, Sharon Reich Paulson. She's unable to be with us here today, but I have some notes um, that she's given me. So I, I think that some of uh, that some of UVM's concerns are very similar to what has been voiced already. Um, we did have our Title IX coordinator participate in the, the prior council, um, Nick Stanton, and I think we are a bit worried about um, time uh, as, the, as, as in particular the state colleges mentioned that our Title IX coordinator um, is, is generally very busy hearing and adjudicating cases on campus. And 
um, was was thinking that uh, a good suggestion might be that if we name the Title IX coordinator as a UVM representative, that he or she may have the ability to delegate to someone else on their staff if they're unable to attend a meeting, um, that having the Title IX coordinator attend every meeting might not be possible given um, their role on campus. Um, I also know I also note the um, call for student members um, and one of the questions we had is how those um, folks would would be identified and um, we'd be thrilled to be able to nominate someone to do that if if that was desired. Um, I think that um, one of the other things that we were thinking about is um, that we just, I think our general counsel wanted me to um, make sure that everybody understands that we think that this is great to talk about prevention and education, but she wanted me to remind folks that when we're talking about issues of investigation and adjudication, that that is governed by federal law and not something that we have to do on campus. Um, I think that we're a little bit worried about the term best practices in the legal sense um, that we know that participants in this council will be well-intentioned in talking about that, but best practice may uh, connotate national expertise um, or sort of all college type of expertise. And I think that we're somewhat uncomfortable with that terminology, maybe call it promising or educational. Um, I think Susan brings up something that we're concerned about, which is the survey issue. Some of the surveys that we do climate surveys on our campus for a lot of different things, and some of them already include um, pieces about sexual and other type of um, domestic violence situations. I do agree that with the amount of surveying that we do on campus, for some of which is federally required, that um, it can give students some, some survey fatigue, and we don't always get um, great response rates on surveys when we've tried to do more in any given year. So I would say that we, we do um, want to be careful. And also, as mentioned, lots of our institutions um, are very, very different in their size and scope. And so a sur if we want to avoid making a one size fits all survey if, if we're talking about surveying, because a survey that would go to, the, to Sterling College with 130 students and the University of Vermont would probably have to be quite different. So we, we just wanted to um, mention that. Um, there is some data and some science, which I think we can provide you all if you're interested in it, um, that shows that doing these surveys are not always um, the best way to get it at some of these issues. Um, I, I think also that um, in terms of some of the data sharing, we are a little bit worried about privacy concerns. Um, we wanna make sure that in any data that um, is shared that we are complying with FERPA regulations and not um, identifying students in any way. Um, and lastly, I think that um, the one other thing that wanted she that our general counsel wanted me to mention was that um, she does feel that this doesn't need to necessarily be a legislative group that maybe this should be a group that's that's run by the group of colleges and universities. Um, that being said, I think that that covers uh, everything else that we were worried about and and happy to provide you with any of that uh, scientific data information or with any of these points in writing too. Happy to answer questions as well. Thank you. Tanya Vihovsky has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have two questions. One is back directed um, to the Vermont State Colleges, and it sort of gets to the something that came up during the private college discussion, and that is about the differences on campuses. I hear you that that you know you have four campuses within the same system, and it and asking for four different Title IX individuals to come to the table would be unwieldy. And I worry that maybe what's happening at Castleton is very different than, than what might be happening at the Linden campus. And so I just wonder if you can speak to that for me. Or uh, Michelle, I don't know if you would like to speak to that since you are one of the coordinators and actually communicate regularly with the other, uh, other coordinators on that. Absolutely sure, sure to share some thoughts on that and, and make sure that I that I understand your question clearly. 
Um, so for the Vermont State College System, the Title IX coordinators, uh, we, ha we typically meet on a very regular basis, and that includes a representative from Castleton, uh, from Northern Vermont University, um, and from, I'm forgetting, forgetting one, and I apologize for that, uh, Johnson, Linden, and Castleton, and Vermont State College System. Uh, we have been meeting on a, on a regular basis throughout the semesters. I will say due to the pandemic and, and other uh, areas of focus that we are meeting on a more unofficial basis, uh, we'll check in with each other um, when, when the need arises or if we need to just share some, some suggestions and thoughts on education and prevention. Um, but we do work very closely together and I'm very grateful for that. And within the Vermont State College System Office of the Chancellors, uh, we also have a wonderful Title IX coordinator and general counsel who also communicate with us on a very regular basis, uh, sharing with us uh, best, best practices that are available to our committee and also to provide us with other opportunities to get additional training. I'm not sure if that answers your question um, appropriately, but please feel welcome to ask me to clarify. No, that was really helpful. Thank you. That that regular connection together really helps ease my mind that all voices across the system will be represented. Um, my other question is just a technical question. So there's seven, and it might not be specifically for the Vermont State Colleges, but there's 17 colleges we've listed in the state of Vermont. And I wonder how many, um, if any, are non-residential campuses and if that changes the the impact of, of sexual violence on campus. I know CCV is non-residential, but I don't know if any of the others are. Right, uh, happy to answer that. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan also would like to. So I'll just say briefly, CCV definitely is not a residential college. And there are components of, uh, for example, Northern Vermont University uh, has a program called Northern Vermont NVU Online, and that's a non-residential uh, program. So there are some components of, uh, of the other colleges that are non-residential. Uh, and for the private colleges, Agater College and Vermont College of Fine Arts, they are both low residency programs. So their students come from across the United States and just come for programs usually 10 to 14 days at a time. Uh, also SIT, the School for International Training in the Brattleboro area, all, they don't have any programs on their Vermont campus anymore. They're all abroad. And at UVM, most of our programs are, are residential. Um, in During the pandemic, we do have about 2,200 students who have chosen a remote option, an at-home option. So at the moment, we have a significant population that is not uh, residential. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I want to um, uh, also support the, the notion that 28 may be unwieldy. I know that's already mentioned. I already talked about the balance of students relative to providers, uh, other interested parties. Uh, I guess I want to go back to the possibility that there would be uh, in, in ascertaining uh, the uh, campus climate uh, survey fatigue that was mentioned. And I'm wondering whether that language should be loosened up uh, instead of focusing on a vehicle for um, ascertaining data, uh, rather change the language so that you're actually focusing on what you want to know from the data as opposed to how you collect it uh, and get around that and sort of allow the, uh, a little bit more diversity as to how each campus or administration uh, gets at the uh, data that you want to collect. Uh, in other words, flesh out the meaning of climate. What do you mean by climate? Uh, spend some time on figuring out that instead of using a word like survey. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, anyone care to, to jump in on that point, or should we um, take that as, uh, as a, a good echoing of what we're hearing uh, in terms of concerns around the climate survey? Go ahead, Wendy. I, I think that that suggestion is a, is a good one. And, and as I said, I think that some campuses may already have some data inf information that we conduct through um, different surveys that might answer some of these things. And my guess is that that's true on other campuses besides UVM. Great, that's a helpful suggestion. John Gannon. 
Thank you. Um, a comment and then a question. Just um, looking at the first five groups of memberships, it appears that um, there could be a requirement that a college or university have multiple members um, on this group. And if there's something we can do to eliminate that so that there is a single representative from each college or university, I think would, would slim down the number of participants in, in this council. Um, and then um, my question is to Wendy. Um, she said, I believe you said that th th this doesn't necessarily need to be a legislative group, that maybe this should be a group that's run by a group of colleges and universities. Could you explain that a little more, please? Um, I don't I don't know that I have any more of an answer on that. That was something um, that I received as as feedback from our campus. I think that um, I think there's some concern about data sharing. I think there's some concern and I think that they think I think that there's some feeling that maybe the colleges know how to um, deal with that best in terms of the federal re regulations that we're under. Um, and I also think that um, there's some concern about having an advocacy organization um, as the person in charge of report or the entity in charge of reporting and um, running the group. Thanks. All right, so next I would like to um, invite Rory Tubo, who's the Washington County State's Attorney, to share any observations or thoughts on the makeup of this council and, uh, and, and share any recommendations you have. So good morning for the record. I'm Washington County State's Attorney Rory Tubo. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Copeland Hanses, for the invitation today. Uh, obviously, uh, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs has a lot more uh, contributions and opinions about the um, other substantive parts of H-183 uh, regarding changes in the law. But from a perspective of um, this group, I think we agree with the Attorney General's recommendation that there be both uh, a prosecutorial representative in some form and also a sexual assault nurse examiner added <clears throat> to the composition. I think that's important and it mirrors really how uh, we use our multidisciplinary team or MDT group to supplement the special investigative unit in Washington County. It brings together a lot of uh, different voices. I think my comments will be really limited uh, and I'll defer to the expertise of both uh, Sarah Robinson and also uh, those who are actually in the business of uh, Title IX about uh, the exact composition, but I, I would echo that there is definitely a need uh, for this type of assessment. There's a lot to be said about improving systems uh, in the state. Each county uh, has some variances in its relationship, uh, both with law enforcement and then the law enforcement purview and responsibility for college campuses in that area. And uh, from my perspective, Washington County has several uh, smaller institutions and one large one uh, being Norwich University. And in that uh, sentiment, in that sense, um, it is important to have a good flow of communication and clear expectations when addressing college uh, sexual um, assaults and uh, sexual harassment. Uh, I know, again, the Title IX process is separate and distinct from uh, the criminal process, but ensuring that there are uh, systems in place to allow victims a, a cognizable and appropriate choice is important. So I think this is a, um, be a welcome addition to helping uh, ensure there's best practices and understanding a little bit more of the scope of campus sexual assault in the state of Vermont. Uh, this mirrors other efforts made at a federal level in other states. So I think uh, it does deserve our attention and uh, the department is happy to be part of it. One note I would say is right now there's some open-ended language in H-183 as drafted. Uh, it's not typical that we, uh, we didn't want to have both an AG representative and a state's attorney representative on there. Uh, the question really comes down to perhaps the committee's preference of who should be the person to select that. Um, you know, default and say the attorney general could select that and, um, you know, pick somebody from the, the stable state's attorneys if need be. There's generally a good relationship there and I don't think it'd be a problem. Um, but I think we have a lot to contribute to uh, how to best serve victims and uh, ensure that there's a handoff from people who make a Title IX complaint to a criminal complaint and ensure that our victim advocates are uh, informed in that as well when our office does become involved. With that said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Roy. John Gannon. Thank you, Rory, for testifying today. And you, you sort of started to touch on, on the question I had, which was the language in the bill around the prosecutor being appointed to this council. 
Um, the language right now is a little unwieldy because it could be from either the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs or the Office of the Attorney General appointed by, we don't know at this point. Um, who, so who typically um, prosecutes um, sexual assault cases that happen on Vermont campuses? So really that'll defer and usually default to a county prosecutor. Um, the Attorney General takes you know, a much smaller percentage proportionately of cases in the state. I think right now the criminal division is six or seven you know, attorneys versus about 63 or 65 or so uh, in different states attorney's offices. So from that sense, the volume of cases is often with us. Um, but there are any number of reasons why the attorney general may become involved. There may be some, you know, special circumstances of a case, a conflict uh, in an office, or alternatively, it may be uh, a case of significant notoriety or complexity that it warrants, uh, you know, the, sort of that level of care. And in that sense, I would say that, you know, we have a fantastic group of assistant attorney generals in the criminal division, and they do tend to have a, a slightly reduced caseload versus what a uh, field deputy state's attorney would have. And they can really sink their teeth into and deep dive into these cases when need be. And to just follow up on that, do, do you think we should modify the language in B10 slightly, just say a prosecutor that has experience with sexual assault cases on college campuses so that we are actually having somebody with expertise in that area? Sure, and I think, you know, in, in it might all actually open up too in writing it broadly as a prosecutor. It might not then limit it to being a state prosecutor. It could actually be a federal prosecutor. And I know that we do have some talented assistant U.S. attorneys who have a deep background in dealing with crimes of sexual violence and uh, do overlap uh, from time to time uh, in these issues. And, and I, I think each office around the state of uh, state's attorneys, I can't say, generally has somebody who is proficient and, and skilled here. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a great pool of people to select from, and I don't think there's any, uh, you know, fighting or um, pushing by any department to, you know, to feel that as all of our uh, agencies, you know, have a lot of uh, different committees, boards, and groups that we uh, contribute membership to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory. Um, I appreciate that you're probably noticing that we're running up against the noon hour. Um, so thank you for uh, being very direct and, and to the point. Um, and John, great questions. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Rebecca Turner, uh, who's here uh, with the Defender General's office and, and hear any thoughts that you have, Rebecca, on the makeup of this council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner from the Office of the Defender General. Um, so I think my main points and comments were to, um, well, trust and point this up, the, the makeup of, of the council. And what struck me here, and I, I understand I've heard the concerns that's already unwieldy. So um, my suggestion would be that there are actually, a, there's a significant missing perspective uh, on, on this council. And that is the perspective of the, person who stands to be accused of these allegations. And, um, and so I look through it in the 20 some positions, there is not uh, anyone there who can share um, perspectives from people who, uh, again, are likely to be, um, to be accused. Uh, the, the most clear and obvious omission is someone from the public defender's office. I mean, here we have an inclusion from the prosecutor's side, but not from the office of the defender general. So uh, the most simple addition there, there should be some, uh, some seat at this council from that perspective, um, or at least the criminal defense bar. Uh, another critical perspective, and I think this one warrants a bit more explanation, and that is that we need voices and perspectives from the BIPOC community in Vermont on this council. And BIPOC um, voices, perspectives, their stories, their direct experiences in this is absolutely needed. And, and what I understand about this, and this is, this is an issue that doesn't come up often, um, in the discussion on sexual uh, harassment or, or assault cases on campus, but the intersection of racial issues uh, in that context. And specifically, who, what are the race and ethnicities of the men and boys who are disproportionately standing to be accused in this? Now, my understanding is that 
there are no um, at least from the federal government uh, perspective, and maybe others on this uh, on this hearing can correct me. But my understanding is that these statistics on race of the uh, and ethnicity of the person who's who's accused are not being tracked nationally. So we don't have these statistics. But what we have are anecdotes. And again, others on this call may be able to share what they know um, to the extent the the uh, race and ethnicity of those who are are accused of these in Vermont, but certainly nationally. And uh, there is a professor at the Harvard Law School, Janet Halley, or Haley, I might be mispronouncing her name, but she's been tracking this anecdotally uh, there. And she has seen uh, disparities evident. Again, disparities being that um, men, boys of color are being accused. Now, what we know, of course, is that racial disparities exist in our Vermont criminal and juvenile justice systems. There is no reason why there should be this wide pass when uh, it comes to sex-related offenses in the criminal juvenile justice systems. Uh, and so I think that where we are now with, you know, last summer coming to sort of this national real, realization of, of wanting to be sure and we that we're sensitive to and address and be conscious of sort of the perpetuation of disparate policies moving forward. This is one opportunity um, where there should be seats at the table, not just one, right? And again, my, my point is not just to have one seat, but fair and balanced, again, from people who can speak from the perspective of the accused. I just wanted to throw as a resource out there, um, who are these people possibly should be part at this table? Uh, if, if, if the members of the committee aren't already familiar with Allied Vermont, they have a website uh, and ha it's a fabulous resource listing all the organizations, uh, racial equity organizations in Vermont, uh, and that can be consulted. There is AALV, again, the anecdotes show that it's not just black, brown men and boys, but that it's newly arrived immigrants, new Americans who are disproportionately um, being accused. And so I think it would be invaluable to have uh, or organizations that represent immigrants or new Americans perspectives. Again, AALV is a great resource here in Vermont. The uh, newly established social equity caucus of the legislature might have additional ideas um, or, or places to go and may should be consulted. But that's what I wanted to leave um, you with uh, in terms of my thoughts on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing your perspective. Committee, any questions for Rebecca on uh, on what she's just presented? Go ahead, John. Um, I don't know if this is a question for Rebecca or not, or maybe it's for Sarah, but I, I know that the Vermont Campus Sexual Harm Task Force did have a representative from the Defender General's office on it. So I'm just wondering who made the decision to exclude the Defender General's office? I can respond to that and just say that this was an initial pass based on, uh, you know, the conversations at of the task force. But uh, Don Matthews from the Defender General's Office did serve on the task force. She was a wonderful member of that um, group and made valuable contributions. And we would welcome a representative from the Defender General's Office on the council. Absolutely. Thank you. Sam LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to those who have testified today. Um, I just have a general question about um, getting data, because um, we, we've been hearing sometimes surveys, you know, people, um, you know, get um, not consistent with filing them. I do know sometimes that people have been sent surveys and they purposely like, put in the wrong information because you know this is more like high school based, but going forward, because they're just sick of getting the surveys. Um, but do we know if any information is gonna be taken from actual cases that occurred on campuses? You know, Obviously taking out the specific um, pinpointing information to somebody, but learning from past experiences, do we know if that's gonna be looked at? 
Um, maybe Sarah Robinson has a perspective on that. Um, my thought with respect to that is that the Title IX coordinators from the various colleges are going to have a lot of firsthand experience in connecting with, um, with both survivors of sexual assault and, uh, and folks who've been accused of sexual assault on college campuses. Um, and so they would be able to bring um, a lot of uh, actual, um, you know, cases and, uh, and perspective on, you know, what works and what doesn't work. But Sarah Robinson, you, you probably have another perspective on that as well. No, I, I think that's accurate. And I would say that um, in terms of the you know, campus climate surveys, you know, the intention was certainly not to, you know, mandate one survey in one, one way, the same way, um, but to have an opportunity to share aggregate data um, between various campus approaches to gathering information um, so that we're, you know, this group is able to identify some significant trends that may be occurring across um, institutions and across various settings that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, I just would hope that, um, for, unfortunately, um, where there are events to use real data from, that, that the data is tracked and recorded, um, just to know where, where we could see improvement um, instead of maybe asking people about things that maybe are yet to happen um, or what they feel could happen, like what has happened and what and what we've done to track it and to make it better. Thank you. So I wanna thank all of you for being with us this morning. Um, we, we've had a, 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 a dense hour of looking at a, a brand new bill and understanding the makeup of this council. So committee members, I will, um, ask you to sort of mull over what you've heard this morning and we'll come back to have a committee discussion later today or, um, or first thing tomorrow on uh, some of the recommendations that we've heard. So thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, committee, thank you for hanging in through a very long morning.